Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday online seminar. So to, it's a great pleasure to have Alex Alexakis uh, as a seminar speaker today. So Alex is a good friend. I know him for many years now. So Alex did his uh, PhD from University of Chicago. Then he did his postdoc in uh, Boulder, uh, University of, uh, 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 probably NCAR, NCAR Boulder. Yeah. And then uh, he went to Nice for postdoc, another postdoc. And after that, he moved to Eagle Normal Superior Paris uh, as a CNRS fellow and as well as I think he's a faculty of ENS. I'm, I'm not sure, but anyway, he's in CNRS. CNRS. <laughs> CNRS, okay. He's a CNRS uh, researcher in Eagle Normal. And uh, uh, Alex has lots of uh, varied interest. Uh, he works on uh, rotating static, established red white turbulence image determinants, 2D flows, and many things. So today we're gonna to talk about phase transitions and rotating in stably, well, stratified turbulence. All right, Alex, all yours. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure to give this talk <clears throat> to you. Uh, <clears throat> it's been a long time since we have been apart and we're not meeting in international conferences, so having this web-based conference is always, it's not the optimal solution, but it is a good enough solution uh, given the situation. So I will talk today about phase transition to rotating a certified turbulence. And I will spend uh, some time explaining what I mean by phase transitions. It's not obvious. Uh, the work uh, is the work of my student, mostly Adrian Fankan, who graduated uh, last autumn. And I will start by showing uh, this picture, some motivation pictures. So this is a picture of Jupiter uh, from the side and uh, from the North Pole. And the comment I want to make about these pictures that many of you might have seen is that it looks very different than what we are used to see when we talk, uh, when we show pictures of homogeneous and isotropic turbulence. And this is the aspect that I will be interested in this talk, because homogeneous and isotropic turbulence, we expect, uh, well, generally to see a mess, see vortices uh, intertangled uh, and in a chaotic uh, manner that uh, needs to describe statistically. This is also true here, but you can also see that there is some structure. You see these bands forming, you see these vortices start to organize themselves. We see this big red spot of uh, Jupiter, and all that cannot be explained by homogeneous and isotropic turbulence. These are structures that we need to understand how happened. And we don't have to go as far away as Jupiter, even if we look at our own atmosphere, we see that uh, large structures in uh, the flow of the atmosphere also occur. So you can see the two hurricanes above uh, Florida, which have the size of Florida. And at the same time, you see many small scales. And the forcing, the energy that is injected in the system is by convection. It should be about the size of the <laughs> fragmentation that you see there. <clears throat> so somehow the flow in the atmosphere manages to organize itself to generate much larger structures. And at the same time, there is three-dimensional turbulence, which explains this fragmentation you see of the clouds into small, uh, smaller uh, clouds. So <clears throat> in some way, energy must find a way to travel both to larger scales and smaller scales at the same time. And this is the question I would like to, to answer for uh, rotating a stratified uh, medium, which is the simplified, most simplified model for the atmosphere. So let's start from the beginning. Homogeneous and isotopic three-dimensional turbulence is well known, not to every detail, but uh, we do understand the basic uh, mechanisms that are involved there. So vortices self-stretch each other, and that generates smaller scales. So in Fourier space, we will see that the energy is moves, moves to larger wave constant flux of energy. 
Komogorov K minus five third spectrum and a tangle of uh, chaotic uh, vortex suits. On the other hand, if we look at two dimensional turbulence, uh, we don't have vortex stretching anymore, but we have these shearing motions of vortex patches. And it turns out that this kind of uh, motions transfer energy from the small eddies into the larger scales of the flow. So in wave number space, energy flows to the small wave numbers with a negative flux of energy from where it's injected. And it's when it hits the size of the box, it starts to organize itself in large uh, scale structures. And the K minus five third energy spectrum appears in the larger scales, in scales larger than the forcing wave numbers smaller than the forcing wave number. Okay, and now we can ask the question, can we have a mix of the two? Is there a way that uh, either by introducing the rotation, certification, or confinement, we have both of these uh, physical mechanisms be equally uh, important so that there is flux of energy both to large wave numbers and to small wave numbers? So if we inject energy here, there is a flux of energy to high wave numbers and the flux of energy to small wave numbers at the same time. Generating pictures like that, which is taken from a <clears throat> paper of Luca Biferale of rotating turbulence, where you see a big mess of small scale eddies, but at the same time, large coherent uh, structures. So there have been studies like that, and uh, they go back to 25 years uh, ago. So there was this paper by Leslie Smith, uh, Jeffrey Chasnov, and uh, Fabian Walef with the title Crossover from Two to Three Dimensional Turbulence. And much later, a paper by Antonio Celani, Stefano Musaccio, and Dario Vicenzi, Turbulence in More Than Two and Less Than Three Dimensions. So they have these very uh, fancy titles. But what it's done is essentially uh, looking at the thin layer of our fluid. So it's, it is forced at some length scale. And if it's thin enough, it has both properties of two dimensional and three dimensional turbulence. So in more details, this is the wave number space. They force somewhere here and some energy cascades to the large scales forming K to the minus five third uh, energy spectrum. Some energy moves down. And when do we move to the wave number that it's smaller than the layer of the thickness uh, layer, it recovers again K to the minus five thirds. And this is a picture of the flux of energy that is both positive for large wave numbers, wave numbers larger than the forcing wave number, and negative for wave numbers uh, smaller than the forcing wave number. So energy flows in both directions. That's why sometimes uh, we call this a split cascade, because energy flows both to small and large wave numbers. So <clears throat> if we accept that this is indeed what's happening and not uh, witnessing just finite Reynolds effects or finite box size effects, this is the system that we have. <clears throat> we have a system and we have a parameter. That parameter could be the height of the layer. It could be rotation. It could be st st stratification strength. So we have this parameter to play with. And in one limit, when let's say this parameter is very small, <clears throat> the flow behaves like 3D hydrodynamics and cascades all energy to small scales. And in the other limit, this uh, when this parameter lambda is very large, the flow behaves like 2D turbulence and energy cascades inversely. So as we move this parameter from very small values to very large values, the system transitions from three-dimensional turbulence to two-dimensional turbulence. Okay, what is important to note here is that this parameter lambda, it's not a Reynolds number. Reynolds number, we assume that it's always is very large. So this is not a laminar to turbulent uh, transition. The flow remains turbulent, turbulent at all times, no matter what the value of lambda is, it just changes behavior. So we go from a situation that behaves like 2D turbulence to a situation that behaves like 3D turbulence. And another important point to note is that in uh, most of the cases, it seems that it goes through a state that cascades both forward and inversely. So both to large and to small wave numbers. That is the split cascade I will be referring uh, in the rest of, of my talk. 
So the question then comes, okay, if this is happening, how do we quantify it? So let's look at the energy that cascades to the large scale. So the inverse cascade and measure its flux to the large scales and normalize it by the total energy injection rate so that its quantity is always less or equal to one. One is when all the energy cascades inversely, zero is when no energy cascades in inversely. And we have our parameter lambda that we want to tune from small values to large values. So for small values, there is no inverse cascade. The flow behaves like 3D. So this should be to go, this should be zero. And at very large values, uh, it behaves like 2D turbulence. So this should be one. So there are three possible ways that we can transition from 3D turbulence towards uh, the 2D turbulence. One is that it's gonna be a smooth transition. So unless lambda is exactly zero, there is some weak inverse cascade and the larger the value of lambda is more and more energy cascades inversely, but in a smooth way as lambda is varied. The other option is that there is no inverse cascade up to some critical value of our parameter lambda, after which we have appearance of inverse cascade of the split cascade to be more exact. And there is a third option that we actually jump from one case to the other at, an, uh, at a critical value again. So the first case is a smooth case. In the second and third case, we can also talk about phase, phases and phase transitions, because here it's always somewhere in between. But here there is a phase of fluid turbulence that does not cascade inversely. And then once we cross lambda C, we enter a new phase of turbulence that some of the energy cascades to large scales and start to organize it itself. So it's not that different from uh, tr phase transitions in, uh, in statistical mechanics and uh, like a uh, mechanization of uh, icing model and so on and so forth. Uh, so what we want to know is which of the three cases holds for uh, the systems that we want to study and how is the phase space uh, the phase space diagram uh, looks like in our parameter space um uh, alexakis may i ask yes. you a question at this yes. point i mean okay okay so i mean uh, as for, i mean the way you introduce the parameter lambda i mean uh, to be very honest at the first sight it uh, comes to me something like very much geometric, like an aspect ratio type of thing or something or like inverse of an aspect ratio by which you are just taking the ratio of two dimensions and one when the something like this is very small, then you can say that, okay, this is effectively one dimension or two dimension or something like that. So is it something uh, geometric in nature, the lambda, or this is something dynamic? I mean, in the equations where, Lambda should. I will. Um, I will become more specific very soon. But okay. the an to answer your question, yes, it can be, or okay. it cannot be. It could okay. Be a okay. Rosby number. It could be the aspect ratio of the box. Uh, so okay. I'm trying to to just give a general picture of what we are dealing with, and then mm -hmm. I'll go to, and become more specific. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. So this is a case where we have one lambda parameter where you could have multiple transitions, but then now uh, you can ask yourself yourself the question how about if there's two parameters then instead of critical points we need to, to search for critical lines so we could have the two parameter system that splits my parameter space into two different phases or we could have behaviors like that that along a particular path we meet criticality but if we take a different path we get a smooth uh, transition so these are all stuff that we need to keep in mind that might appear in the systems that we look at we look at, and then that becomes a question that uh, for the atmosphere, which can be represented in the most simple case as a rotating and stratified uh, fluid, we have three at least important parameters to play with. One would be the gravity, rotation, and the thickness of, uh, of the atmospheric layer that can come into play. And that means we need to look for critical surfaces. It could look like something that I drew here, but it could be even more complicated. As it turns out, it's gonna be much more complicated than that. So let's start to be specific. 
So in what I'm going to investigate from now on, it will consider triple periodic boxes where uh, I'm going to assume that it's rotation along the, along the Z direction and stratification along the same direction. I will be solving uh, for the Navier-Stokes equation, the, the Businesk equation, where phi here it's uh, the the perturbation in the density. So, so there is uh, there is a mean gradient of density in my flow, and I, I follow the evolution of perturbations to that. In which case, we can use the Businesk equations uh, in the, their simplest uh, form. And I'm also introducing a large dumping uh, parameter for the large scales so that I can absorb the energy that arrives in the large scales. So my box has a height h that I might want to vary. So to transition from 2D, 2D and 3D, the horizontal dimensions are L that I want to be big. And I'm forcing at some particular length scale L. Okay, so like I drew here. So that leads to many, many, unfortunately, uh, control parameters that I would like to split in two categories. First, there are these parameters that depend essentially on the forcing scale parameters. So one, this lambda here is a geometric parameter, which it has to do with the ratio of the forcing length scale to the height of the layer. And we have the Rosby number, which is one over uh, the rotation omega, or the fruit number that is one over the brute visala frequency, and being uh, the brute visala frequency, which is proportional to the square root of uh, the gravity. Then we have another set of parameters that involve viscosities uh, or hypoviscosities or drag terms, or the size of the box here. So these parameters I want to send to infinity. So I want to, in principle, understand the behavior of the system when the Reynolds number and the box size is infinite. And then we have parameters that I'm going to call order parameters, which is not something I put in. It's something that I take out uh, from the system. And I'm going to refer them as order parameters, taking the terminology from uh, statistical physics. And most importantly, it's, I'm going to look at Q alpha, which will be the ratio of the energy that is dissipated in the large scales. So essentially the energy that arrives at the large scales normalized by the energy that are input by the forcing. And then similarly, we have the, the ratio of the energy that is dissipated by the viscous and diffusive processes in the small scales, normalized again by the rate that I put in. So that in a steady state, the two sum up to one. Okay, and this is the question I want to, to ask, is I want to know how Q alpha and Q nu change as I, as I vary my forcing control parameters, lambda, Rosby, and a fruit number, sorry, that should be fruit number, not N, in the limit of infinite uh, Raylan's numbers and infinite uh, box size. This is what I want to know, because this is how I approach the astrophysical situation when all these numbers are very big. Okay, Alex, there is one question. Yes. So some energy, some injection epsilon in may go to the secondary field uh, uh, that... Uh, yes. Psi, for example. Yes. So Q alpha plus Q nu may not be equal to one. It could be... Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, let me go up. So... So here, by E nu, I include the dissipation oh, okay. by the scalar field as well. I see. Okay. All right. So it's I don't care about uh, if it's viscosity or diffusivity that it's dissipated. I just care that it's it arrived at the small scales and it's dissipated by some way there. I see. Okay. All right. So that's why I put it Q alpha plus Q nu be equal to one. So oh. so I get a very clean number to look at something that I know that goes from zero to one. Okay. okay. So we have this complex. Uh, me. Yes. Uh, what is R alpha? R alpha is here. It's a Reynolds number based on the drug force that I put in the large scales. So it's a Reynolds number, but not for the viscosity which acts on the small scales, but but for this drug term that acts on the large scales. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. So we have a very complex parameter space to cover. Three times there is the height of the layer, uh, omega rotation, and the brum weissala frequency that we can also vary. So that, that makes it quite complex. So what will really help is we try to look at limiting cases. And so this is what I'm going to do from now on. And the simplest limiting case is if I first consider no gravity. So I set gravity to zero. So I forget about the, the stratification and the advected field. And I just look at a fluid turbulence in a rotating frame. So that reduces my parameter space in, uh, in two. So I'm going to write in terms of this parameter lambda, which I remind you is the ratio of the forcing length scale to the height of the layer, and Rosby number. So when Rosby is large, it means we are very slow rotating. So we expect a forward cascade here, while for very small values of rho, we expect that rotation will have two-dimensionalized the flow, and we expect the inverse cascade here. And thin layers are moving up, so very large values of lambda. So we expect inverse cascade here, while if we are at lower values we, uh, of lambda, the corresponds to thick layers, so we expect uh, a forward cascade here. So this is kind of how we expect blue being a inverse cascading presence of a split cascade, while with pink or we expect only a forward cascade. So to try to clarify that, it's also worth looking first at very large Rosby numbers, which means no rotation. So this is a limit we can easily do. We just can set rotation uh, equal to zero. And then we ex just investigate a transition of a thin layer and we only change the uh, layer height. So we measure here Q alpha as we vary this parameter lambda. So, so for large values of uh, lambda, we have a thin layer and there is an inverse cascade. So there's a lot of energy going to the large scales, while almost zero when lambda becomes small. The curve looks smooth, but if I start increasing my box size and Reynolds numbers, it becomes sharper and then even sharper. And if I zoom in, you can see, really see that it, it looks like it's gonna be a second order phase transition. This was based on the work of Santiago Benavides that we did sometime uh, a few years uh, back. So for a thin layer problem, it looks, looks like we have a, a, a critical transition. So that means that as we go to very small rotation rates, very large uh, Rosby numbers, it will become a sharp transition and it will split my forward cascading phase to the split cascade uh, phase. Now the question is what happens as we start increasing omega? So that, that uh, okay, this is some uh, spectra from the thin layer problem. So we saw that in the presence of an inverse cascade as uh, the layer uh, is very thin to uh, diminishing that uh, as the layer becomes thicker. But the question that I wanted to ask is what happens as we increase rotation? So the group of uh, Guido Bofetta had investigated that. So they looked at this uh, curve for non-rotating case for some resolution. So they got this curve, the red curve over here, and then they started increasing ro the rotation and they saw this curve moving to the left. So the stronger the rotation, the thicker layer you can have and still have an inverse cascade. Of course, the curves are not very sharp because these are three-dimensional simulations and it's very hard uh, to have large enough boxes to make this uh, look sharp. But going this way, we cannot really reach very high rotation uh, wave numbers. So what to find out what happens at very strong rotations, what we can do is look at an asymptotic model. So such a model was uh, first written down by uh, Keith Julian and his group, where they investigated uh, flows in very tall boxes and very large uh, rotation rates. So in, the, in my diagram, it's exactly here. Very small values of lambda and very small values of Rosby numbers. In this case, you get a reduced system of equations that you can uh, 
sulfur. And instead of having two small, very small parameters, lambda and Rosb, the only parameter you are left with is the ratio that I'm going to be calling as uh, rho. So having that means that if I find a critical transition with this parameter rho, it means that I have a critical line in my previous parameter space that is linear, uh, gives a linear dependence of lambda c with rho. So we wrote a code that simulates this equation and we started investigating. And again, we get a plot like this. This is my Q alpha. So dissipation at large scales uh, normalized by the injection rate. And we got a curve like that. If we zoom in, you can really see that it's, this is again, a sharp transition for very small values of rho, but still a sharp transition. So that means my parameter space looks like that. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of spectra and fluxes that show two different cases, one that dis displays an inverse cascade and one that's not. <coughs> so again, here right. we have a- go, yes. back, go back to the previous slide. Uh, this? Previous, previous, one before. One more. Yeah. So this is uh, not going a square root, but it is linear in, uh, in uh, QL. It's line. linear, it's linear, yes. It is a straight line. So it is not a uh, second pitchfork, uh, not pitchfork, but it is, uh, uh, what is it? Is it, uh, what is it? No, 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 no. Uh, this, this is my parameter, so it's not the amplitude. Oh, I see, okay. We don't expect the square root of the bifurcation. This is not a bifurcation. This is both lambda and rho are uh, control parameters. I see. So to see the bifurcation diagram, you need one third dimension to plot the amplitude of the inverse cascade as I move across the critical line. I see, I see. Okay. So, so this is just the, 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 the location of the critical line in my parameter space. I see. So you need the flux rather than epsilon alpha. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so, so this, the diagram on the right is the bifurcation diagram, if you want. So okay. it's zero up to here, then it pops up. It again looks linear, but I cannot make a very precise uh, statement here of, okay. of the exponent that uh, it's there. I see, I see. Okay. But so, linear also a possibility, you know, linear, there is a, I forget the name, flip bifurcation or something is called. Well, I mean, we are in a large extended uh, system, so we could have uh, critical exponents that differ from uh, rational values. I see, okay. So there are many, it depends on the detailed physics that are still not understood. So we arrive a picture with a picture like that for the rotating case of a finite uh, a layer. So we have a region in blue that gives split cascades we, and a region in pink that is only forward. And we know the two limits. So if you connect them with the line, we get this diagram uh, like that. The truth is that there are some interesting behavior for finite rotation rates as well, but I'm not gonna go in detail with that. I'd rather start, take the next step and add stratification. Now, it's very costly to do that. So I'm gonna again only limit myself to this asymptotic model that works down here. So I'm gonna look at this corner down here and I'm gonna move in a third direction, which will be the amplitude of the stratification up. So I'm gonna be investigating very fast rotating flows in very elongated boxes where the asymptotic model works. And it was, uh, again, the, the work of uh, Keith Jundian and uh, Edgar Nobloch and Joe Verne that uh, looked at it. And we get a reduced system of equations that uh, apply here for this very elongated uh, box. So it's the same as before, only now I'm adding one equation for the scalar field that couples to the velocity field, the Z component of the velocity field. So we start uh, to investigate uh, this system. So let me give you a few details uh, on uh, this system that we are looking at. So first of all, now we have gravity inertial waves. Before we had only inertial waves. Now we have gravity inertial waves, which have uh, frequency dispersion relation that is given here. That's a function of the wave number. There's no dependence 
on the gravity part because we are in this asymptotic uh, limit. So KZ is uh, much smaller than the K-perp, so it goes away. And there are three different types of modes. This, the two gravity waves that have opposite uh, polarities and travel uh, oppositely. And there are these slow modes which satisfy hydrostatic balance. So we have a, an extra complication uh, here that for every flow, there is this uh, slow moving. Uh, uh, these, these modes here have a frequency exactly zero. Another thing I should mention about the system, we have extra invariants. So before we had energy and helicity, now helicity is gone, but we have the conservation along fluid trajectories, trajectories of a quantity called potential vorticity. So atmospheric sciences, uh, scientists uh, know this quantity very well. It appears very often in their work. It's given by that. Notice that it includes a nonlinear term. And if you write an equ equation for the evolution of Q, it is just advected. If you neglect uh, dissipation and forcing, it's just advected by the flow. Being just advected by the flow, it means that any power of Q is conserved when you average over the whole box. So if we concentrate it only on quadratic invariants, Besides the energy, we have Q square that is also conserved. So that will become important uh, later on. So let's looking at our uh, parameter space again. I said that we have only limited ourselves to this uh, asymptotic model. So our parameters now are this row, which is essentially the ratio of, of omega with the height of the layer. If you think of it like that. And on the other axis, we have gravity, the fruit number to the minus one. So this is proportional to gravity. So the way I've uh, plotted my data, these very large values of rho imply very fast rotations. Very large values of fruit to the minus one imply very, uh, very, very fast gravity. Okay, so we took this system. We went to every point that you see here and we started running numerical simulations. The size of the simulations was around 512 cubes, but it is an asymptotic model, so it, it works quite well. <clears throat> and we note down if we see an inverse cascade or not, a split cascade to be more exact. And we put a red dot if we don't see an inverse cascade, and a blue dot if we see an inverse cascade. And we get a diagram like that. And it looks much more complex than we anticipated because our domain was split in three regions. So we have one region where no inverse cascade is seen. This is the red points over here. And then <clears throat> at uh, values higher of rho and smaller gravity, there are some blue dots on over here. And then we get some blue dots on the right as well for very large gravities. And these flows seem to, these different cases seem to have a different behavior. So the figure on the right shows, it shows the flux of energy, or if you want this, this ratio, uh, <clears throat> towards the large scales. So you see this, if we follow the black points, we see some points decreasing with fruit number, then becoming zero and then increasing back up again. And then the, the rate that they approach different, uh, approaches zero differs with the value of rho examined. So, so this, this plot on the right corresponds to taking a fixed value of rho like this and uh, plotting the, the flux I see to the large scales. So we see, clearly that there is three different behaviors here. And I'm gonna show you some spectra to further justify this. So here is spectra, spectra from the forward cascading region, the, the first phase, if you want. 
And let me explain you the colors. So the black line is the total energy. That's kinetic plus uh, potential. So the forcing is here when you see this big peak, there is some energy that goes beyond, but it stops there. It doesn't go any further. So there is no flux of energy to the large scales here. And it forces some power law, but it's, we have too small range to, to comment on the, the, its value. Now the red line is the kinetic energy of the, of the components in the plane. So perpendicular to omega. The blue line is the component, the energy corresponding to the velocity in the parallel direction to omega. And the cyan line, the light blue, is uh, the potential energy. So there is some of them going to slightly larger scale than the forcing. Actually, it's just half uh, of uh, forcing length scale. And it stays there, it doesn't move any further up. If we move to the second phase, so that would be this phase over here, we see that there is energy piling up and reaching the larger scales, but not any energy. It's, this is almost completely uh, composed of the kinetic energy uh, of the in-plane velocity. So that's the velocity components perpendicular to rotation. That's the, the red line. The potential energy and uh, the parallel uh, to omega velocity component does not contribute at all in the inverse cascade. And in the third region, we see not only the in-plane velocity, but also the potential energy moves to larger scales as well. So this case is clearly different. They both show an inverse cascade of energy, but they have very different behavior. One does not lead to inverse cascade potential energy, the other does. And these are the fluxes that give the same result. In one case, fluxes go to zero. There is no flux of energy to larger scales. In the second case, there is some weak uh, negative flux that we see here. Black line is the total, red is the in-plane components, and the other two is as, a, as the spectrum. So there is inverse flux of energy in the strong rotation heating case. Uh, <clears throat> while in the strong stratified case, there is also potential energy that cascades to larger scales. So the light the blue line is also negative here. So let's try to understand what we have here. Ah, we should also show you some results from the visualization. So that's the, uh, <clears throat> the density field on top and the vorticity field below. Uh, so for the forward cascading, we don't really see much, just a mess. The strong rotating, you see that everything is very well aligned along the rotation axis, which is the Z. You cannot really see the large scales, but that's just because uh, uh, the cascade is very weak. So you cannot spot uh, if you plot the vorticity large scales here. And in the second, in the third case, is the case of strong stratification. You can see also, you can see here clearly large scales for forming both for the stratification and the vorticity field for the velocity field. So let's try to understand a little bit this. So we have this diagram here, phase diagram. And let's first look at these two cases and the transition from two to one. So that's easily understood because before, when we didn't have stratification, we were looking at this axis. So essentially, here for uh, zero gravity, we have a non-gravity problem, and this is the figure that we had before. And you can see this is the value where the transition is observed, right about here. So as we move away from that, well, gravity <clears throat> is suppressing the inverse cascade. And this is understood because this, is, uh, this was done uh, uh, by Bofetta some time ago that for very weak uh, stratification, the, the scalar field acts as passive. And if it's passive, it cascades to smaller scales. And that means that there is an extra channel for energy to cascade 
to small scale. So the energy that is trying to cascade inversely is captured by the scalar field and it moves down. So that's why if we just add a little bit of certification, it delays the onset uh, for an inverse cascade. That's why we have initially an increase uh, of the boundary of the critical line as uh, gravity is increased. But then we move to the, if we move to higher, high enough values of gravity, we have the second transition from one to three, which we do not really understand. And it puzzled us for quite some time, but then we realized it's, uh, what you can do is expand a little bit further, do another uh, expansion for large gravity because we've, before we had only used large omega and uh, tall boxes. If you also include uh, that the gravity is strong, you get a different system that has a name. It's called the quasi geostrophic equation. So, in this limit, there is a geostrophic balance, a hydrostatic balance, if you want, between rotation and stratification. And the system reduces to one equation because a lot of terms uh, uh, cancel. And that equation is nothing else but the, but, uh, the advection of uh, potential vorticity. So we reduce the system and core, we reduce our system even more. And we end up with a new equation, the quasi geostrophic equation that has some very interesting properties. So the interesting properties I talk about is uh, the invariance because the invariance change in this case. So we have the energy as we had before that can be written in terms of a stream function uh, where this Laplacian here, it's a, a rescale Laplacian for the parallel uh, derivatives with the, what is called the Burgers number, which is the ratio of fluid to the Norrosby number. And we have the potential vorticity that in this case, the linear terms, the nonlinear terms go away. And that its square can be written as the Laplacian of psi square. So we end up with a situation that looks very, very, very similar with two dimensional turbulence and the conservation of energy and entropy. So in 2D turbulence, we have conservation of energy, which is the gradients of psi square and estrophe, which is the Laplacian of psi square. And here we have the same thing. We have potential vorticity being conserved, which is the Laplacian of psi. And because this, there is this relation between the two quantities, just like vorticity constrains energy to cascade inversely, in this case, potential vorticity constrains energy to cascade inversely. Uh, so we try to test if this is indeed what we are seeing here. And to test that when the uh, quasi geostrophic limit, there was this relation that I wrote a few steps back, which is this, uh, this equation over here. There is this hydrostatic balance, this equation here. So the vorticity is linked to the scalar field. So if we plot the two quantities that are supposed to be equal, so these are results from the previous set of equations. When I'm not changing the system, I'm studying the previous set of equations, but in the limit where one could in principle apply the second uh, asymptotic uh, limit that I derived. So I'm plotting these quantities and one can see that indeed there is one to one correspondence. Every time you see a big red structure on the left, you see it on the right. Maybe the small scales are not that well correlated, but the large scales are very well correlated. So that means that we are indeed in the quasi geostrophic limit. And that also justifies why we see an inverse cascade of potential uh, vorticity because the two fields are connected. So you cannot have an inverse cascade of kinetic energy without having an inverse cascade of uh, potential energy as well. So with that, we arrive at this discrete phase, at this phase space diagram that we kind of understand now. So we have this region that behaves like quasi geostrophic flows. We have this region that behaves 
like the fast rotating uh, flow and a three dimensional uh, flow over here. But we are still very limited. There's still a lot of parameter space that needs to be explored. We are only looking at an asymptotic limit here. And this is what in the future work we are planning to do. So I wouldn't conclude, I think it's my time, uh, with uh, the following remark that uh, the transitions from the different phases that are observed from the to the forward or inverse cascade uh, uh, problem, it was much, much more richer than we anticipated. And I believe that there is a new era of uh, turbulence discoveries that are waiting for us. So with that, I, I finish my, my talk and thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Alex. Great talk. Okay, so we can take questions now. Okay, Alex, may I ask you the question? Yes, of course. Okay, so I mean, uh, this is a fantastic talk and I mean, we can see really a new horizon if I can say that. So, um, I mean, what, uh, I mean, because you also have sometimes, uh, I mean, worked with this compressible turbulence. So what do you think this type of, uh, I mean, phenomenology can be extended also in the similar manner for compressible turbulence or uh, it is only for with businesque things, I mean. Compressible turbulence is always much harder. And uh, I've been avoiding it throughout my career. <laughs> <laughs> no. say, yeah. Because it leads to many complications that uh, it, they are very hard to deal with. One of them uh, being that uh, there's also transfer of thermal energy to kinetic energy or kinetic energy to thermal energy that is quite difficult to deal with because the thermal energy is not quadratic and uh, mm -hmm. that leads to, to further uh, complications. But in principle, at least close for um, not too highly compressible flows, it's could uh, be applied. And in principle, one does see cascade of energy to the small scales in compressible flows, and one does see an inverse cascade of energy in 2D turbulence of compressible yes. flows. Yes. So in principle, one would be able to see something similar for compressible flows. So my guess is, yeah, my answer would be yes, they should be extended to that, but there is work to be done to, to yeah yeah I, yeah. I was mostly wondering that if you have thought about the controlling parameters for that, but okay, if you have not yet, I mean, started then yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, and the thing is that uh, you add also more control parameters, and this yeah, is, yeah, of course. <laughs> this is three parameters that I'm dealing with here, and it's already too much, and I only have to go to asymptotic limits to to make some understanding of, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. of the system. So that's what uh, uh -huh. limits me from going to add one more parameter. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, I guess Alexander, you want to? Yes. Uh, hi, Alexandros. Hi. Uh, okay, nice uh, pick, nice, nice talk, excuse me. Um, but I have some question, maybe, if you want. Yes, yes. First, uh, maybe on the last uh, result, it's about uh, when, when you have uh, an equilibrium between uh, vorticity and stratification. Yes. It's occur at large scale, and maybe uh, it's, it's due maybe to the quasi geostrophic uh, mode. But maybe it's due to the to the wave. It's a, it's a mix between inertial and uh, gravity wave because uh, the wave occur at large scale. Uh, from what I've seen, I mean the 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 modes that satisfy hydrostatic balance, yes. uh, they're not waves. We agree with that. Oh uh, yes, of course. This is a, a model, but uh, for the simulation, where you have the yes. uh, exact equation of uh, yeah. so and, uh, the truth and, is that we haven't gone to very detail uh, investigating that. Uh, but when we uh, showed, I showed this plot. Yeah, exactly. You can see that the large scales are very well correlated. Yes. While the small scales, I and mean, if you look at the small details here, the, they do not always exist here. So my, uh, without being certain, but uh, from what I have seen, 
it seems that the, the large scales are in the hydrostatic equilibrium and the small scales not so well. And the other thing is that it it had, might have to do also with the forcing we are using because of when our forcing we do not force the gravity waves. So it's uh, normal that uh, you don't have as many. So that could be affecting uh, uh, this result as well. So you could change the behavior if, if the forcing was forcing only the gravity waves, for example. But from what I've seen and I can tell it's the large scales reach the hydrostatic uh, uh, equilibrium are in hydrostatic equilibrium where the small scales not so much. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to justify the inverse cascade uh, if, if they were not uh, the large scales in hydrostatic uh, equilibrium. I mean, to have an inverse cascade, the flow either has to behave like 2D, which is not clearly the case here, or it has to to, to be close to this quasi-geostrophic limit, so you can justify the inverse cascade in this case. When you have the stratification and rotation, okay, we, we know that uh, for, uh, for the rotation, the large scale is uh, the geostrophic mode. It's a, it's a, it's a mode uh, yes. that is uh, elongated along the vertical axis, whereas the large scale for the stratification is uh, just a shear mode. It's uh, just a... Uh, yes. Uh, yes, and when you add uh, the two uh, two ingredients, what's happened for the large scale? Is it always uh, we, uh, elongated along the vertical axis? So, so you get. Can you see my cursor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you get something that satisfies this balance. That this is equal to that. So you do get variations along Z. Ah, okay that are accompanied by its variations of the density field that balance them so that uh, uh, they are in equilibrium. It's not obvious. It's not obvious, no. Okay. I am, we were very puzzled with this third region and uh, uh, you need to think about it sometime to, to really understand uh, what's going on uh, there. Yes, because for the rotation, uh, the large scale deal only with uh, velocity for the shear mode for the stratification it deal only with velocity and yeah. you see now the, this large scale is a, is a mix between buoyancy and uh, yes velocity okay yes yes uh, yeah, it's, it's not obvious no it's not obvious at all it's it, it took us some time. i mean i it took us some time quite some time to <laughs> realize uh, what we were seeing I, I have another question, maybe if, if I can. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Mahendra uh, is the boss. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Alexander. No <laughs> okay. Um, uh, when you study the, the transition, maybe for the rotation, you okay? You say uh, you say you said okay. Uh, I deal with uh, infinite Reynolds number, but but uh, as you know, you you have an effect of the finite Reynolds number in particular. You have the inertial Reynolds numbers, uh, the ratio between Osmidov and uh, yes, and, um, and Kolmogorov uh, flow, and with this Reynolds inertial Reynolds number, you can go to strong turbulence to the wave turbulence, and uh, is your transition is independent of uh, this number of this uh, inertial Reynolds number or not? Or okay, so. It's true what you says. Uh, uh, I'm not dealing with infinite Reynolds numbers. I would like to know the answer for infinite uh, Reynolds numbers. So what I do is I make the runs and then I try to repeat them for even larger Reynolds numbers and see if I get something that converges or not. So the results are not always as clear as I would like them uh, to be. So it's very possible that there is still a dependence on the Reynolds number that I have not seen because I mean, to be frank, if you are running a 512 box and you force at K wave number, let's say eight, so that's uh, mm. divide three times by two, that's 256, 128, 64. So it's like running a 64 cube forcing at wave number one. Uh, 
So yeah. that's that, that's the kind of runs we did in the eighties. So so all my statements are with that limitation that uh, uh, we are running with uh, very uh, small values of rain loss numbers, and as we increase them, maybe we start seeing more stuff. So it is. I will leave it as an asterisk that yes, possibly there is some dependence on the Reynolds number that I have not seen yet. Uh, but at least for uh, for some problems, I start to see some convergence. Not so much on the rotating and stratified because we just started the last two years to work on that, so our runs are not uh, that extended. So. My frank answer would be that I um, cannot be answered with certainty. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I would say that maybe because just for for uh, to to clarify the, my purpose, maybe the transition between uh, the two states is just uh, the transition between high reliance number and low reliance number. It's not a uh, because. Okay, you measure a transition. I agree with you, but uh, what is uh, okay? You is exactly what you say. You have um, in one case you have a large structure, large two-dimensional structure. I, I just take the case for the rotation. Mm -hmm. You have the the geostrophic mass, the two D structure, and when your parameter decreases, you have um, no large structure. In fact, this is uh, yes, and maybe in one case you have only wave turbulence. And in another case, you have the backscatter inverse cascade, and you have the large structure. But it's between these two uh, two states. In fact, is the transition between maybe wave turbulence and uh... well, the thing is, if you're talking about weak wave turbulence, yeah, it only applies in the limits of having an infinite tall box. Yeah, in, in theory, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, uh, and you while to have an inverse cascade, you need to have a finite box, otherwise it yeah. won't work. So if you consider that you fix rotation and you change the box size, then in one sense, you're right that once your box okay. becomes too tall, it's because you enter the wave turbulence regime. Uh, and if it's short enough, then wave turbulence does not apply because quasi resonance are are not there and so on and so forth and you get the inverse uh, cascade so yes that would can be a way of seeing it yes i would agree okay thank you thank you yeah. okay i'll shake uh, yeah hi alex can you hear me yes yes i can thanks for the fascinating talk so i was trying to understand the the parameters lambda and then lambda by ro so lambda is L in, so that's the index, energy induction length divided by H. So is yes. that, so can we interpret it like the K min by K forcing? Uh, well, K min in the vertical the, direction. In the vertical direction. Yes, yes. So in that, that case, in that case, lambda is like the forcing wave number, which is uh, because the K min will- You I can mean, see it like that, yes. Okay. Let's go here. Right. Yes. Yes. Then, you can... then, right. So, so thanks. And lambda by ro. So I just rewrote that. Uh, so lambda by ro, I can write it as a ratio of the nonlinear time scale, uh, with based on the forcing wave number. So L in divided by u, uh, two omega inverse. Okay. Yes. So lambda by ro is uh, L in by u divided by omega inverse, which is yes. the forcing time scale to the rotation time scale. Okay. So in that case, lambda by RO seems to me like uh, another Rossby number based on the forcing because Rossby number can be defined as a ratio of the two time scales. Uh, yes. So yes, it could be seen some rescaled uh, Rossby number that uses the length scale of, of the height of the box to do that. Right. So, so this is, yes. So, so rho in that case is like a rescaled Rossby number. It's a rescaled Rossby number. Which okay. takes into account the forcing and the forcing length scale. Yes, yes. Uh, and, the, and the fact that you are in a very tall box. Right. Thanks. Uh, yeah. so, 
so in some of the plots uh, where you had this uh, the pink region and the blue region mm -hmm. uh, forward cascade and split cascade yeah, yeah like this yes so the, the numbers were not uh, on the not clear on the axis so where where do i take rossby number equal to 1 and like lambda equal to 1 <clears throat> if so rossby number is too large then we don't expect any split cascade at all so I guess Rossby number, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll let you answer. Also for that particular exam, I mean, the exact numbers are not, I didn't, this is a sketch that I do. I didn't put them because it depends on some details of the system. So how you force exactly and uh, stuff like that. But just to have an idea, it's, it's an order one parameter. So if you see in, on the diagram on the right, so this is essentially being a very large row and moving along this line. So the transition happens around lambda equal uh, 3.5 or something like that. So it's an order one uh, parameter here. And <clears throat> in the other case where I was looking at very small Rosby numbers, then we got something like a much smaller number. It was actually 0 0.03 roughly. Right. So, so usually it's the moderate Rosby number regime, which is the, the hardest to the, the the Yes, yes. And you do see some interesting stuff there that are not expected and I didn't really uh, have time to talk about them. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> but the general shape of the phase space diagram is like the one I drew here. With some extra bubble here that it's looks like it's there is some it looks like there there is some metastable region that if you will wait long enough, it will look like that. But uh, some cases you get some extra phase that is metastable. So but joining, yeah, so joining it with like a thick line, maybe a, a, like a ex extrapolation, maybe yes, better. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So there's another question I had from the plot on where you had this periodic boxes shown. Very, very nice. Yes. Plots. Yes. So the, the, the result plots, sorry, so where, where you had omega z shown, the omega yeah, z yeah. the phi shown, I think towards the end, the runs, the uh, results from the simulations. Ah, the results of simulations. Yes, yes. Okay, so here? Yes. A box. Right. Okay. So I was very surprised to see that in the strong stratification case, there is, seems to be an anticyclone and one cyclone, positive vorticity. And so there seems to be overall... Uh, uh, I can, at least one dominant cyclone, one dominant and cyclone. So, and in the case of strong rotation, that doesn't seem to be case. I mean, I, I cannot identify a particular okay. cyclone. And the, the thing is that to, 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 to see that we had to wait very long time because the inverse cascade case was very weak in this case. Oh. Uh, so if you, if you, if you look at the plot, I had to zoom in to show that there is, in, this is indeed negative. Or something like 0 0.05, while this is almost an order of magnitude larger here. Yes, that's right. So that's why you don't see that. And another thing is that uh, vorticity is not the best way to, to, to visualize large scales. So if you look closely, you, you can see that the, the, the vortices are kind of uh, so they are piled up together, and yeah. that's actually the, the, the inverse cascade. So, if I have plotted something like a stream function, it would be more easy to see. This one, we uh, let it run quite some time so we get a clear uh, uh, image. Uh, but this was, was hopeless to wait for it to, to, to pile up. So, so, you mean that you see a time dependence also, and uh, I think you are showing plots. Uh, after which you don't expect any time and mm -hmm. any more time dependence, isn't it? So, so uh, we put the dumping at large scales that was preventing it also from reaching very big values. Uh, this one, we, we removed that dumping and let it run a little bit further so we get, get some clear image of how these structures look like. Because this is kind of, we know what it does. This is the fast rotating case. This is something was something new. So, so we really wanted to see yeah what's going on there so we removed the dumping and started to see what starts to form alex uh, one question yeah. regarding this your forcing is uh, random or is it kind of uh... it's random it's it's random delta correlated in time so we fix the injection rate 
yeah so that may be one reason why your uh, large scale vortex may be uh, for rotation what, I mean, what uh, 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 Avishek is expecting is for one mean rotation and here there is a forcing that may be destroying the uh, large scale structure which may be appearing over time well if, if i let it if i if i had let it run for a very long time i would see two big vortices there too i see oh. okay uh yeah. all right so there's another question uh, you're done Avishik? Uh, yeah i had this uh, comment about this uh in continuation to what alexander said so fruit equal to ROSP is i think a very difficult regime to a very difficult regime to interpret i think that's what you also said yes uh so in the parameter space graph, the lambda, uh, lambda by root mm -hmm. divided by one by fruit. Like this one? Yeah. So uh, where would be this fruit equal to Rajbi? So Burgess number equal to one, where would that be roughly? Uh, Maybe much higher because... Uh, well, I mean, this is an asymptotic model. So I have rescaled uh -huh. along. So this moves away from where we were before. So. So before we were in the diagram at this corner down here, let's make a, over here, and then I moved in a third direction up by increasing stratification, but always remaining very close to this corner. Okay. If we went up there and start moving up, then it's a whole new story. It's a new kind of works. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. So Roshan has a question. Roshan. Uh, hello. Hello. Ah, yes. The, it was a very interesting talk. And in 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 that final uh, uh, picture where you showed the structures, if we go to that uh, slide, the uh, the the one that yes, in this, so we see that it's a uh, cubic box. But I think the it we started off with an elongated box, right? In the schematic yes. you had shown. Yes. So yes. Uh, I don't understand. Is this a section of the box that is being shown? No, no, no. It's 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 rescaled uh, values. This is the box. Uh, that's a very good question because I didn't mention that. Uh, <clears throat> when you do the asymptotics and you end up with the equations I show, these are you have rescaled the vertical uh, value of the box. Okay. Okay. So this is a very tall box that I, I have compressed it uh, so that it uh, looks like a square. Okay. Okay. Uh, now so I get it. So one centimeter horizontal is much, much smaller than one centimeter in uh, vertical. Yes, yes, but the structures don't look squished or anything on, but that's how the rescaling is done, that means. Yes, yes, because okay. it's, because it's uh, we rescale the Z coordinate okay. by one over epsilon. Okay. Okay, so maybe it's quite uh, late, but I'll ask one question. Yes. Uh, Alex, uh, so you are, there is a uh, the velocity field and the density field are correlated by this uh, yes the hydrostatic uh, balance hydrostatic balance so so that is what is pulling both uh, u and uh, uh, density to go backward i mean uh, yes yes i see because uh, the phi has to be such so that it's equal to that but actually in the picture in the third picture below uh, what is that uh, uh, cyan color or that uh, cyan color is forward cascade is that correct uh, i mean I the, the cyan uh, is uh, is the potential flux energy flux of potential uh, yeah but that is forward but you said uh, potential flux also is inverse right? so so it's positive of course here uh, but here it's not zero like the blue line is the blue line is exactly zero I but the see. Uh, cyan line is slightly negative. I see. So, so here uh, to answer Alexandre's, uh, I mean, not answer, to basically to contrast the wave versus the, uh, the geostrophic mode, he, uh, I find that the spectrum there is a, they're going together, the velocity field and the uh, density field. Yes. Uh, can that give a signature whether it's a, it's a, it's a geostrophic mode or is it a wave? wave had it been a wave, then would, would there be a correlation like this? Or <clears throat> you understand my question? Or that could be a way to contrast the 
wave turbulence versus geostrophic uh, mode. Geostrophic will give the relation between U and uh, U and density. Yes, but I I mean in simulations you can actually output it and see how well that relation uh, really holds. That's right. So in this in the and if, it, if it does. I mean, you can see that one has to be proportional to the other. That's right, I see. So, and the proportionality co constant is actually the Burgers numbers, which is the ratio of uh, root by sala frequency to omega. So, doesn't it answer the question because if they're proportional, so that should uh, say that it is the geostrophic mode, not the wave turbulence. The debate- yes, I but in, in, in principle, I could construct a, a spectrum that is only of gravity waves, and they are proportional. I mean, it's not necessarily true that uh, if they are proportional, they are in hydrostatic balance. I see. I mean, if, even if they are proportional, not with the right proportionality coefficient, uh, they are not in hydrostatic balance. I see. Okay. I, I don't fully am, I'm not convinced either way, but. Okay, anyway, let's. Uh, I mean, for first. me, the most convincing thing is this picture here, where I plot the two terms and they look very well correlated. That's what I feel. That's what I meant. Uh, this is a. This correlation is, uh, in fact, you can also plot. Yeah, this correlation is uh, proof in some sense, numerical proof. Of course. Yeah, Andrian was graduating, so I couldn't push him to further. But I would have liked to do some more statistics. Of the two, so so do some uh, dispersion diagram in one axis is this quantity, and in this the other axis is this, and put a point for every point in space, also show if they are well correlated or not. Uh, but we didn't have time for that. He had to I graduate, so I know, I, so I let it go. Yeah. So one last question in some one of the earlier slides, maybe some sixth slide or so, both of them forward and well the two cascade, which both of them gave five third. Uh, one of well, the earliest slides. As I said to Alexander before, it's uh, the, the the range that we have. I see. It really does not allow us to make. Uh, if you want to look at the spectrum exponent, you should force at wave number one and look at the wave the spectrum that develops at small scales. I see. Or force at wave number. 20, 30, and look at the spectrum that it develops in the large scales. We do not have the computational power to do both of them at the same time. Uh, I see. So uh, essentially you are focusing on the flux and flux signature is what uh, you're yeah. wanting to use for characterizing split class scale. Yeah. Okay. All right, Alex, great. Thanks a lot. So we uh, had- uh, Thank I you have a very question. much for inviting me. I enjoyed the questions very much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Excuse me, but, hello. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, could you hear yeah. me? I have a question. Yeah, okay, Manor, please go on, yes. Yeah, so so thank you, Alex, for the nice talk. Mm -hmm. So I have a question in, on slide number 40. Uh, what slide? 40. 40. So where yeah. you showed what is Four zero. Structure. Yeah, so here in strong rot uh, rotations, the Rossby number is very small. And in your uh, system, you force at large wave number. And your parameter lambda depends on that web number. It means that at large web number, the parameter lambda is smaller. And the yes. number is also smaller. In that yes. case, you have a large split cascade. It means large inverse cascade. Yes. So if mm -hmm. there is large inverse cascade, then I think you should have some, some structures there in case of force rotating turbulence. Having some structure where at which scale? Because the because he's talking about the vorticity, the vortices, but that's what he told about. Yes. Uh, Avishik, uh, if for you, Avishik answered no. Wait for long enough. To, anyway, I wish, so same question is Avishik. I think uh, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, if I understand correctly, that to see a large structure, first of all, it's not a great idea to visualize the vorticity because you have to really wait until it piles up, like in the case on the right. And uh, you have to wait for a long time. It's uh, okay, otherwise you won't uh, see it, even if there is transfer of energy to larger and larger scales. If I was plotting something like uh, instead of the vorticity, the kinetic energy density, then maybe you would be able to see that uh, there is some uh, alignment uh, and creation of larger scales. Uh, 
I mean, you really have to zoom in. You might see that there is some big vortex here and some big vortex there, but uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, it's question. not easy to really see it. I, okay, the, so the question is, is that structure depends on forcing wave number? Because yeah, if you uh, force at a small wave number, you should see some structures. And if you force at larger wave number, you don't see and that means structure. You see like this, this type of structures. Well, if don't in, have... in 2D turbulence, if you force at small wave numbers, you will see a large scale structure in the box size. And this is the same here. It's just in 2D, I can wait for very long times. In 3D, I can't. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Actually, I think uh, Manohar did some work I forgot on, uh, on forcing, I don't remember. Uh, Manohar, did you see something like this? Uh, okay, I'm sorry, we are extending the discussion. Did you see something yes, like yes, this while you're forcing? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have yes. also forced at large wave number and we don't have a nice structures in our system. Uh, in, for what system? So, uh, Post-rotating turbulence. Yeah, in rota rotation. Rotating. Rotating. Uh, so are yeah. you rotating fast enough? Yeah. yeah, yeah, very fast. It was one of the, like Rosby was 0 0.001. Yeah, 10 yeah. to the power minus three. So we'll send you the paper and maybe that is, uh, uh, I now recall, uh, but his forcing was at uh, 50, I think, right? KF? No, sir. It's, it's, okay. it's, uh, well, it's I know, 40, uh, 40 and 80. So it depends 40. on resolution. I know there was a paper by Luca Biferale that uh, he was forcing quite uh, high wave numbers with a random isotropic forcing and he still saw uh, inverse cascades. I think one of the pictures that I showed was from his paper. I think it was way at the beginning there. This paper, this picture over here, that's from a paper of Luca Biferale. It's a rotating turbulence forced with a random uh, uh, isotropic forcing, and uh, he still he... did see inverse cascade and structure. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think now I recall, we'll send you the paper, Alex. There is yeah, inverse we... cascade, but it is basically the large scale structure which uh, Manohar obtained for freely decaying turbulence. Uh -huh. Freely decaying, rotating turbulence were pretty long structure if you wait for long enough time. That wasn't the case for forced turbulence when the forcing was at around 40. So we send you the paper and okay, maybe yeah. that yeah, may have a like connection, with, uh, connection with that. So this is in 2016, I think, or 18. No, we'll send 18, you the 18, paper. 18, 18. Okay. I would like to see that. Yeah, great. Manohar, you can send in the paper, okay? All right. Okay, sir, okay. Great, so we had a long discussion. Uh, thanks a lot, and I hope you're not too tired. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. I really enjoyed uh, it. It's great. Okay, great. So hopefully see you soon, and uh, yeah, no. we'll meet again. All right, thanks, yeah, everyone. Thanks.